I'm so glad that you've tuned in to one of the sermons from St Mary's. If you're new to our church and would like to find out more about being involved, please visit our website and drop us a line. We'd love to hear from you. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servant. must soon take place. He made it known by sending his son and to the testimony of Jesus. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood and made us to be a kingdom, priests serving his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And on his account, all of the tribes of the earth will wail. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Thanks be to God, indeed. You might like to uh, have that open in front of you, that first bit of Revelation, uh, right near the very end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 1, um, Bible in front of me. Let's pray. Loving Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can lift up our hearts and worship you. And thank you too that we can learn from your word and grow together in our faith. So would you open us up, open our ears and our hearts and our minds to you this morning, to what you want to say to us as individuals and us collectively. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let me tell you about uh, the first time I rode on a proper roller coaster, okay? It was called The Dragon. And it was at a small fun fair uh, near to where my grandparents lived. And I'd been to that fun fair uh, several times before, and I'd observed other people bravely riding on the dragon. And I, on this occasion, had psyched up the courage to um, take my turn. And I remember the feeling in my stomach as we clicked up that first slope to what felt to me as a child like a sky-high peak. In reality, it was probably just a few meters off the ground. But I remember screaming with a mixture of terror and delight as we plummeted down and round the bends and finally it chugged back to where we began. I suspect that if we choose together to ride the roller coaster that is Revelation this term, we might be in for a similar mixture of horror and exhilarating joy. Because this book has more than a few twists and turns and plenty of highs and lows. But there is one thing that we can be absolutely sure of. And that is that if we get on board this roller coaster and enter into the ride, we are not going to end up back where we started. Because Revelation is a book that is much more about transformation than information. 
And so as we explore it together, we should expect ourselves to be changed by the loving power of Jesus at work in our lives. A few weeks ago, I saw a very funny Mr. Bean sketch where he is riding a roller coaster. You might have seen it or you could go and uh, Google it and find it on YouTube. He is surrounded by screaming people in the train as it takes them up and down and loop the loop. And all the while, Mr. Bean remains entirely unfazed. He just has this like poker face. It's as if his body is riding the roller coaster and his mind is somewhere else entirely. And it would be possible for us to approach Revelation a bit like that. We could come along, we might even come along faithfully every week and hear the talks and hear the Bible being read, but not really join in with the journey. And so my hope and prayer and, and that of the leadership here, we've all been praying into this, is that we will embark on this journey together. And that we're going to find ways to engage deeply with this really challenging, but also really exciting part of scripture. And um, it's going to take us three months, all the way up to Easter. But I pray that as we do that, we'll find ourselves inspired to go beyond what we're hearing on Sundays. I pray that we're going to want to dig deeper during the week and read more on our own and maybe watch videos and uh, discuss with other people the things that we're uncovering. And in all of that, I pray that this is a season which helps us to deepen our sense of togetherness as the body of Christ here at St. Mary's. I pray that there is a collective transformation, that we might be able to look back in a few months' time and say, we're a different kind of church now. We've changed in some way. But before we kind of buckle up and get started, I want to offer three things, a reassurance, a warning, and a recommendation, okay? So firstly, always good to start with the reassurance. John tells us right at the very beginning of this book that as we explore Revelation, we will be blessed. Chapter one, verse three, he says, blessed are those who hear and keep what is written. So we can hold on to that promise and be confident that God is going to bless us as we encounter him through his word. And that is really, really good news. And hopefully you're smiling underneath your mask um, because, or smiling at home on the screen. Um, because that's good news. We can prepare to be blessed. But there's also a caveat, a warning about the way that we engage with what we might hear. It might be helpful, and forgive me if it's not, to think of Revelation as discovering an unexploded bomb. <laughs> okay, there are a few of those probably still out there from, from the war. Um, and we, so if we discover an unexploded bomb, we definitely shouldn't ignore it. But also, we shouldn't approach it and think, oh, brilliant, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna dismantle it and take it apart and put it out into all of its tiny components and sort of spread them out in front of me. I don't think we would attempt to do that unless we had special training. Um, so we need to give revelation due care and attention. But if we dismantle every single detail and try to work out what each of them means, then we're likely to end up getting lost in a fog, which is kind of hard to return from. Now, for the first few weeks, um, you might think, why is Gemma given that warning, that caveat? But believe me, when we get into the middle section <laughs> of Revelation, we will do well to remember that point about details. So we've had our reassurance and our warning. Now to the recommendation. You might have already heard or read in the church family email um, that we are recommending a book. It is this book. And uh, all the people that are preaching um, through this series, we're really encouraging them to read it because it's really helpful. It is called See the Strange. See the Strange. It's by somebody called Brett Davis. He's an American. It's a self-published book, which means that actually there aren't that many copies out there. Amazon have sold out. Blackwell's 
still have it. Um, I don't know for how much longer, because several people have already said to me, oh, I'm about to order that, or I have already got it. Great news. Um, if you like to read, um, then I'd really encourage you to get it. They are short chapters. My, my copy's got lots of like underlinings and scribbles and things in the margins, but they're even a few little pictures. Um, short chapters, very, very excessively written. Um, I would really encourage you to get that. It's going to help us. It's going to be like a travel guide as we take a tour across the landscape of Revelation. It will say so much more than what the preachers on Sunday mornings are going to be able to say, though we will be drawing on it. And one thing that um, Brett says in the first chapter um, is this. He says, I've come to see Revelation as a beautiful book, an ingenious, inspired masterpiece of literature, calling us into beautiful lives worthy of the beautiful future prepared for this world by our beautiful God. I wonder whether or not at this moment in time you actually agree with that statement. Until recently, I was actually quite wary of Revelation, and I'm aware of lots of other people that feel the same. I don't think that beautiful would have been a word that I would have used to describe it as a whole, beautiful though some bits of it are, and those are probably the bits that I've read more than other bits. But what I've realised as I've read through that book and as I've read through Revelation again in Scripture is that there is so much more to this about the big picture of what it's trying to show us. Or rather, because absolutely, yes, there are some confusing parts. And I think, for me, there are some quite scary parts as well. But ultimately, Revelation tells us the story of Jesus. It does it in a very different way to the gospel writers. Their approach is obviously more like a biography, whereas Revelation feels a bit more like a graphic novel, which um, is kind of the sort of modern name for a kind of a cartoon strip. What it's worth noting, though, is that John, who wrote the gospel, is the same John who had the vision and who wrote Revelation. So actually, John is able to tell the same story using two very different styles, but ultimately communicating the same thing. That God himself is going to bring full and complete salvation to the world. That is, in a nutshell, the message of Revelation. And that is why we should expect to be transformed by what we discover here. Because, and I don't think this is too much of a spoiler alert, but we're going to find out that love wins. It is painful and it is messy and it is costly in terms of how we get there, but the ending is glorious. Love, as we know from our own lives, will always in some way transform and change us. And so my prayer is that we will encounter God's love for us and for his world in new ways as we take this journey together and that we will see God differently. Because at its very heart, Revelation is a book that tries to help us to see things clearly. The clue is in its name. In ancient Greek, at the top of the letter, John would have written the word apocalypse as the title, which means a uh, revealing or an unveiling. That's why we get revelation. It's a disclosure of what had been previously hidden. And it's as if in this awesome vision that John had, God has given him a glimpse of what's going on behind the scenes of the universe. It's like he takes him backstage and says, look from this vantage point understand how my plan of salvation is going to play out. In the Gospels, the writers show us Jesus in all of his wonderful, beautiful humanity, whilst also making it clear that he is divine. And in Revelation, we glimpse from that other vantage point, the cosmic Jesus, his majesty and his power on full display but without losing that connection to his flesh and his blood. 
And so in that sense, Revelation is not primarily concerned to show us the future or to help us to fully understand exactly what might happen in what we may call the end time. Revelation wants to show us Jesus. It is, in fact, a revealing about Jesus from Jesus. Yes, the future is important. Yes, we need that vision of the new creation. We need the confidence that in the end, love wins because those things keep us going as we journey on through our lives on earth. But we are invited to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. As opposed to analysing the signs and trying to work out what stage we're at in relation to it all. In the book, Brett Davis says, the goal of Revelation is that we would faithfully follow the Lamb through suffering into the sunrise of his new world. Faithfully follow the Lamb. Keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. And if we can do that, then we can be sure we're on the right track. Next week, we're going to hear the second bit of chapter one. And Simon's going to set things more in context for us to help us to get to know John a bit better and the world in which he was living. But for now, just as we kind of uh, shift gear a bit today, I just want to draw our attention to a couple of things from these first eight verses that are going to set us up to better understand the rest of the book. And the first thing is this. Revelation often will put familiar things in a strange way in order to get us to sit up and take notice. Just like we might be prone to apathy, so John's hearers were also prone to apathy and to kind of being blind to some of the things that are familiar to them. So in verse four, at the opening of a letter, you might well, because it happens a lot in the New Testament, expect John to say something like, grace and peace to you from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. He might expect him to say that. Instead, he puts it like this, what is actually in verse 4. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. You see the difference? <laughs> John gives us quite an involved description but in essence, he is saying the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But because he puts it in a different way, we take notice of it, and we're invited into something deeper, which might lead us into new understanding and insight. And the other thing that happens in that um, very succinct verse is we see the first occasion where numbers are used in a surprising way. And we're going to see that time and time and time again in Revelation. So we're used to numbers being taken literally. So if I say um, I have two children, I mean I have two children. Um, whereas in Revelation, numbers are very rarely literal. Okay, They're usually symbolic. So in verse 4 there, where he says... Um, the, the seven spirits who are before his throne, because of what I was just explaining, we know he's talking about the Holy Spirit. But it doesn't mean that somehow the Holy Spirit has seven different parts. John's trying to say the full, complete Spirit of God who is everywhere, always animating everything. Seven there is all about completeness and perfection. By contrast, Six is a number that symbolizes imperfection, incompleteness. As a number, six is woefully inadequate. Number six and a whole load of other numbers another time. But Revelation gives us lots of opportunities to ponder on numbers and their deeper meaning. So as we read through Revelation, we need to expect things to feel and sound strange because that is John's intention. He's trying to write in a way that will startle us and make us take notice. And he wants to shake us from our apathy and his original hearers um, and see Jesus in a new way. 
But as I said, the message of Revelation is the same as the message of the Gospels. It is the same message which runs through the whole of the Bible. And we get it there in verse 4. It's grace and peace. God's salvation plan is grace and peace. And Jesus' purpose is to save our broken lives and our broken world. But as we read through scripture, we see time and time again that healing, salvation is painful and costly, but Jesus is devoted to it. For him, it is so painful and so costly that it leads him to the cross and to death. As we come into land this morning, I want to just end by briefly exploring an analogy which isn't my own, it's from the Brett Davis book. But I do think it's a really helpful one to have in our minds as we traverse this landscape. Now, I know that some of you here have had the awful experience of having chemotherapy treatment for cancer or for supporting somebody who you really love through that process. And I haven't been in that boat, but I know enough about how chemo works to understand that often the patient gets sicker before they get better. And the treatment for getting rid of the cancer that's invaded their body. But often cancer patients persevere with that brutal regime because it's their best hope of getting better. The chemotherapy drugs are not intended to kill, but to heal. You need to be careful not to push that analogy too far. But it might be helpful to think of what we encounter in Revelation as God's chemotherapy for the world. The way that God is going to pour out his healing, his grace and his peace is through his judgment on sin. And it's God's judgment of all creation that will destroy everything in the world which is not life. It's his way of getting rid of the bad things and keeping the good things that bring life. And so when we cry out, as I'm sure just in those in our hearts we often do, come Lord Jesus, it's because deep down we know that there is so much that is wrong with our world and also within each of us. And we know that the problem of sin is of pandemic proportions and the only way to make it right is for Jesus to come again, to come in judgment and burn away all that is not life and all that is not love. Jesus will come again. Revelation is absolutely clear about that. But when he does, there will be groaning, there will be pain, because we will be getting rid of all of the darkness, that which is in the world and that which is in us. His aim is to heal through his grace and his peace. His aim is to make the whole of creation fully alive and ready to spend eternity with him. But just like the chemotherapy treatment, it is not going to be an easy ride for the universe. The roller coaster is a very bumpy one. But he is with us in the carriage. He's next to us all the way. He's reassuring us that every twist and turn, that the end is in sight and our future is secure because we trust in him. Love wins. Jesus is with us. He is the Alpha and the Omega and the everything in between. And so if we keep our eyes fixed on him as we take this journey and as we journey through the whole of our lives, then we have nothing to fear.